It's the Christmas paradox. We just got out of season with all of these messages of peace on earth, goodwill to all, and we have the tradition of the Christmas lying. You've got a whole trajectory that has built, that concerns parents sometimes, of this whole trajectory of St. Nicholas of Myra, a early Christian bishop whose story and its relationship to this guy. Oh, and there is the Christmas tradition of responding to that gift that you received that maybe you find hideous. <laughs> so we're going to be talking about lying today. So what do you say when you get that without lying? So what, what do you say? What, yes, all right. Yeah, um, one that you've, you can say, I have never seen a sweater like that. <laughs> it's honest. Now, I really, really try not to lie to anyone. I think that trust is incredibly important. And I want the people in my life, the people that know me, that are in my household, the people I work with, every, people who know me, always feel like they can trust that I will never intentionally lie to them. But what about politeness? We're going to be, we're beginning our new year with conversations on Christian ethics. And last week we talked about the importance of our motives. How, why, when we do things, the why that we do them, the, the reason that we do things, may be as important as what we actually do. Jesus upheld the law, the Torah, but he took it a step further. And he was also concerned with the person's motives. What's inside your heart? In his way of living, it's not just enough to do the right thing, but it's about doing the right thing for the right reason. And the philosopher Immanuel Kant was a giant in modern ethics. And he didn't consider ethics to be a religious field per se, but he was highly influenced by the teachings of Jesus and his example. And he doesn't shy away from the challenging things that Jesus said. And I appreciate that about Kant. But there's not a lot of gray area in Kant. He's a pretty binary guy. Things are either morally worthy or they're not. They're either good or they're not good. He was, he was a big believer in a duty to a way or a law that you as an individual freely chose to live by, a moral law. And that moral law was because it was so deeply tied to morals, it couldn't be wrong. It was not subject to opinion. And as a result, Kant makes people kind of uncomfortable. He takes Jesus' teachings to a point that Jesus never would have. And still, he captures the challenging aspects of Jesus' teaching. But I think he missed a few things in there, too. Today, we're going to talk about lying. And I'm sure you're shocked to know that a black and white kind of person like Immanuel Kant was not a fan of lying. One of his early critics wrote that Kant's insistence that lies are always wrong was crazy. This critic wrote a case, an example case, the case of the murderer at the door. He wrote this as an example. So imagine that you have a friend who is staying with you. And there's a person who wants to kill your friend. And that person arrives at your door. And this person demands that you answer 
where your friend is. Because, and you can tell that this person has a clear intention to kill. The critic writes, only a crazy person would insist on honesty. In fact, it would be immoral to tell the truth. So what do you do with that? Now, Kant responded to his critic and held his ground. Even in this case, lying would sacrifice a person's sacred duty to living in a moral way, in a way that upholds truth. I'm telling you, when it comes to lying, uh, uh, Kant was all in on this. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Job with his officers and all Israel with him. They ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David rose from his couch and was walking about on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. David sent someone to inquire about the woman. It was reported, this is Bathsheba, daughter of Iliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. So David sent messengers to get her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Then she returned to her house. The woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. So David sent word to Job, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Job sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked how Job and the people fared and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. Uriah went out of the king's house and there followed him a present from the king. But Uriah slept at the entrance of the king's house with all of the servants of his Lord and did not go to his house. When they told David, Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, you have just come from a journey. Why did you not go to your house? Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah remain in booths and my Lord Job and the servants of my Lord are camping in, in an open field. Shall I then go to my house and eat and drink and lie with my wife as you live and as your soul lives, I will not do such a thing. Then David said to Uriah, remain here today and also, and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day. On the next day, David invited him to eat and drink in his presence and made him drunk. And in the evening, he went out to lie on his couch with the servants of his Lord, and he did not go to his house. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Job and sent it by the hand of Uriah. In the letter he wrote, set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting and then draw back from him so that he may be struck down and die. King David lied constantly. Elaborate, self-serving, self-preserving lies. And despite all the lies, he was a king frequently referred to as close to the heart of God. I want you to keep that in mind. Now Jesus, though, isn't like that. He lived differently, and lying wasn't part of his way. And so with the case of the murderer at the door, can you think of any way to respond to the murderer that would not be a lie, a moral way? You could say something like, you don't know where that person is at the moment. Yeah, they're upstairs, but, you know, but they might not be, so you don't know because they're not in your presence. You could mislead the other uh, person, the murderer at the door a little bit. Okay, so let's get into misleading. 
Now we're in that gray area of life. And Kant really doesn't like to be there. He responds that it is morally acceptable to attempt to mislead someone rather than to lie. Because even in your attempt to mislead, you are still attempting to honor your moral duty to a moral law. Nineteen ninety-eight seems like a really long time ago now. It was long before fake news and alternative facts, and the issue of the day twenty years ago this month was pre was the President Clinton Monica Lewinsky affair. And the president went before the nation twenty years exactly to this month, and said that he did not have relations with that woman. Now eleven months later. In the House of Representatives, they were considering bringing impeachment. And when asked if the president lied, the president's lawyer made this argument. But was it illegal? Or immoral. Yes, he misled. But the lawyer argued that the president didn't actually lie, didn't commit perjury, because at the time when he went in front of the nation, he didn't regard what had happened as relations. Yes, he was trying to mislead, but he didn't act illegally by the laws of perjury, and he did not act immorally by the ethics of Kant. Huh. How about that? Welcome to the gray area, Mr. Kant. Was President Clinton's statement truly morally worthy because it honored the president's deep commitment to the truth? Or do you get the sense that he, like King David before him, was motivated far more by saving his own skin? Kant wants to live in a moral world. So do I. I want people to be able to trust that I will not lie to them. I want to foster relationships of trust and respect that uphold the dignity of all people. That is not the world that I get. The seeds of the kingdom of God, this vision of Jesus, of a world lived in God's way. Those seeds are all around us, yes. But there's a whole lot of darkness out there that makes things gray. And this is why I love what I have found in the God of Jesus and his way of living. Now, the Apostle Paul, was a person who did horrible things. He had the phrase, he breathed threats and murder against the people of God. He did horrible things. He could be arrogant. His, his attitude about women, honestly, it baffles me to this day. He was not perfect by a long stretch. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am made of flesh and blood, and I am sold as a slave to sin. I don't know what I'm doing because I don't know what I want to do. Instead, I do the thing I hate. What Paul discovered in his journey as a Christian is what King David found too. We have a God who knows us knows everything that's in our heart, knows the conflict inside of us, 
knows that all that we are and all that we are not. God sees our brokenness in spite of our best intentions and our motives. And God responds with grace. Jesus said, don't judge so that you won't be judged. You will receive the same judgment you give. Whatever you deal out will be dealt to you. Why do you see the splinter that's in your brother or sister's eye, but do not notice the log in your own eye? How can you say to your brother or sister, let me take the splinter out of your eye when there's a log in your own eye? You deceive yourself. First, take the log out of your eye. Then you will see clearly to take the splinter out of your brother or sister's eye. Jesus wants his disciples, wants you, to evolve, to grow spiritually. Yes. He encourages you to be radically honest about the motives that are inside of yourself. Be honest with yourself as best you can be. But not in terms of some kind of judgment, like somehow if you get it wrong, you're going to be cut off but in order that you can grow on this journey. Because the world is gray. It's a mix of light and darkness. And human beings, that grayness is inside of us. Despite all of our intellect, we will not figure out morality on our own. And so we work on it. We draw encouragement that there is a grace, bright shining as the sun, that is with us, and that grace is inside of us. That we can do our best to love like Jesus, knowing that we will screw it up in some way because our motives are not always pure. We can take risks in this life to do radically good things that we want to do, trusting that there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God. And this is what Kant misses, I think. He misses grace. In his binary world, he misses the grayness and the beauty of grace. When we do not do what we want to do, when our motives are conflicted, it's grace that gives us second, third, as many chances as you need to grow. So you figure out what you're going to do about Santa and how you're going to respond to the ugly sweaters that come into your life and all those far more serious moral and ethical questions. But know that as you're growing and you're trying to figure things out, that God's grace, God's patience and forgiveness are with you always. Amen.